space is just another environment. You know, it's it's just like way way back we used to look at the high seas and people try to figure out how to how to monetize that and how to make it work for humanity. The same thing applies to space now. So we're looking at it through a slightly different lens. And the opportunities exist in things like agriculture, education, investment, insurance, entertainment, the arts, sports, I mean, you name it. Everything we do here on terra firma is eventually going to be something that we have to consider uh, once we leave Earth's atmosphere. What could go right? I'm Zachary Carabell, the founder of the Progress Network, and I am joined, as always, by Emma Varvalukas, the executive director of the Progress Network. And we are having these conversations with illuminating individuals about illuminating topics, about where we are in the present and where we're going to go in the future, and always where we've been in the past. And one aspect of the 20th century that was really front and central for, I don't know, 20, 30 years was the space race and the, the, the moon shots, the mission to Mars, the competition between the Soviet Union and the United States about who was going to land first and whose flag was going to end up on our one major satellite as a way of saying our system is better. But it also animated generations of hope and optimism about the endless, boundless potential of humanity and this new frontier that we were going to explore and see. And that kind of went in abeyance a bit, partly because of the Challenger disaster in the 1980s, partly because attention went elsewhere. And in the past few years, we have had a renewed set of attention for a somewhat different set of reasons, which has been the efforts of Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson and what has been called and what we will refer to, I think, in this conversation as the Billionaires Boys Club, sending themselves into space, spending a lot of their own money to check out what's beyond the advent horizon. But there's a whole world there of, of both spending and exploration and competition and the possibilities and the scientific possibilities that most of us don't really think about much, but which animates governments and agencies and individuals, both in the military and in the private sector, to spend years of time and many billions of dollars. And it is indeed the final frontier, or at least it's a final frontier, uh, that is increasingly becoming part of a global conversation about where does humanity go next, where does collective governance go next, where does exploration go next. And so we're going to have a conversation today with someone who is literally at the forefront of this, Che Bolden, who is a career military and has now started a group, which uh, Emma will talk about, that is dedicated to becoming what he calls the, the collective platform for space business and space exploration and space governance. And I think it's an area that most of us, except for a moment of headline, don't think about, but is a vital aspect of where human beings are putting their future attention and at best putting their hopes for future progress. So tell us about Che, Emma. Che Bolden, as you mentioned, is the executive director of the Inter Astra Group. We're going to be talking to him about his work there today. He's also the president and CEO of the Charles F. Bolden Group, which is an executive leadership firm established for the global advancement of science and security. He's a 26-year Marine Corps veteran. Uh, he has extensive experience in aerospace, political, military, and international affairs, critical infrastructure, and a whole lot more. Shay was also a federal executive fellow at the Brookings Institution, where he was immersed in cutting edge policy discussions around ethical AI, digital transformation, human machine collaboration, and a lot more. So let's talk to Che. All right. So Che Bolden, you've had a, a fascinating career, fascinating background, family life. I want to get into some of how you, uh, how you became Che. But let's start with this venture that you are launching. Launching is probably the apropos word. Uh, we used to all grew up of a certain generation in Star Trek land of, you know, space, the final frontier. And you are now launching us into that final frontier. We're going to have to find a way not to keep using that word. 
<laughs> so, the cliches are good. Everybody loves cliches. So. I know. Someone should definitely do the indefensive cliches. They're kind of ways to embed genuine wisdom and cloak them behind a scrim of dismissiveness. But that's for another conversation. So <laughs> tell us about why you're doing what you're doing. I mean, there's a family background there. There's a personal passion. Uh, I was struck by you launching your your space venture uh, mm -hmm. because that you know for those of us who are not immersed in that world it it feels uh, other separate alien other than a few high profile billionaires thrusting themselves into the ether so how did this you know, happen like I, I think your your last statement is probably where we start um, yes yeah, so. You know, I, I did grow up in the shadow of shuttle. My father was a U.S. astronaut and uh, went to space four times. And so I, I am not unfamiliar with space and, and space exploration. Uh, it was never anything that was deeply rooted into me, however, uh, because I always envisioned that it was for superheroes. Um, and so some of the events that have happened of late, as we've seen fairly ordinary people, if you want to qualify, you know, a billionaire as an ordinary person, the things that they've been able to do with their capital and the opportunities they've been able to create with their capital kind of pushed me towards this idea that, uh, that space needed to be something more than what it is. And so my company, the Charles F. Bolden Group, which focuses on the leadership for the global advancement of science and security, we, try, we were trying to figure out how best to position ourselves to add value to the world. And the inherent knowledge that we have of the traditional space uh, enterprise, and then, frankly, the the innovative spirit and the creativity of all the people that we've got involved with us, led me to decide, not quite unilaterally, but almost unilaterally, that we needed to focus our efforts on creating better opportunities in space. As as the commercialization of space picks up, private space launch starts to bring the cost down. What we haven't seen yet is more and more people get involved in space. And part of that is due to just a really poor narrative. The last time the world, forget about just the United States, the last time the world heard about space and was truly inspired to go to space was John F. Kennedy. You know, so we're talking about, you know, 60 years ago uh, when, when we were actually motivated to pay attention to space. And, and, and as someone taught me, you know, and we can talk about our the gathering that kind of led us to here right now, but someone who was at this gathering with us, you know, made the point space is around us all the time, day, night, it doesn't matter, no matter where you are on the planet, space is ubiquitous in our existence. And for every common, you know, for common people, there needs to be more to it than that. It can't be something that they just look up to and use their imagination and think about the possibilities. We have the, we had the technology, you know, I, I grew up on a $6 million man, so I almost can go down that cliche right there, but you know, we do have the ability, both from a capital perspective, from an intellectual perspective, from a technological perspective, and even from a mo motivational perspective, we have the ability to, to do more with space. And I think that it's, it's, you know, kind of a mandate for us because we've been privileged enough to, to be given the expertise and the experience to expose more people to it, to guide the conversation and to create more equitable opportunity for people. So that's how we got into it. And we formed uh, what is called Interastra. And I, we chose the, the Latin term for a double meaning. You know, it literally means among the stars. And so we're talking about bringing the stars down to humanity more, but then the people that we wanna get more involved and give a greater voice to, we consider stars as well and bringing them together. So that, that was kind of how we got motivated for this. The hard part now is making it, making it go, you know, giving it the fuel so that it can lift off. Like what I did there. So <laughs> that was yeah, great. That was it was perfect. 10 out of 10. <clears throat> so Shai, I was going to ask you to expand a little bit upon, you know, what we could be doing more of the exciting things that are going on in space. Um, Zachary and I had another conversation uh, with another Progress Network member a few weeks back and we touched on space and Zachary was very excited about it. And I was kind of like, Mm, I don't know, you know, and I was sort of unpersuaded at the end of the conversation. And since then, you know, I've done a little bit more research. I've understood what's going on beyond the like Bezos and other billionaires thrusting themselves into space. So I would love to hear from someone who's actually, you know, in this field, like what are the exciting things that are happening? What are the possibilities that, you know, we could be reaching? Yeah. I mean, the, the first thing I always have to make sure people understand is I, I have to qualify that I'm, I'm, I'm an observer like everybody. I've never been to space. I'm not an engineer. I'm not a, I'm not a, a, a 
I'm not an astronaut, um, but the opportunities that space are offering for a lot of people, you know, we have to kind of qualify up until fairly recently, space was a very closed industry. It was institutional. Uh, it was led by major nation states with a lot of capital, and they formed organizations like NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, ESA, the European Space Administration, uh, JAXA, Roscosmos for the Japanese and the Russians. Those were typically the only people that were in the game, and they did very traditional things. And those traditional things include launching, i.e. rockets, uh, putting up satellites, human spaceflight, and multi-planetary exploration. But as we look at it and we as we start to analyze a little bit more, there's so much more. Space is just another environment. You know, it's it's just like way, way back, we used to look at the high seas and people try to figure out how to, how to monetize that and how to make it work for humanity. The same thing applies to space now. So we're looking at it through a slightly different lens. And the opportunities exist in things like agriculture, education, investment, insurance, entertainment, the arts, sports, I mean, you name it, everything we do here on terra firma is eventually going to be something that we have to consider uh, once we leave Earth's atmosphere. And I actually have to say, because we started to become partnered up with another organization, space and space exploration is not strictly limited to out of atmosphere. I have been educated recently that it is below this ocean surface as well, considering we've only explored less than 5% of the ocean. So I think if we start to think of both of those two environments or domains in kind of the same context, then we'll find that there's a lot more opportunity out there to kind of grow, not just, you know, human knowledge, but human opportunities, value. You know, we, we, we are in a capitalist society. There is a lot of value to be created in, in space exploration. And, and those are the types of things I think that have excited me. And I hope that are going to start to excite more people. And, and, you know, it's obvious if those of you who are actually watching this, you can see that I am a man of color. Um, there's not a whole lot of people that look like me. Uh, you know, there's, there's not a whole lot of people, Emma, that look like you that are involved in space. And so we obviously want to create more equitable opportunity for people to get involved um, because it is something that, that benefits all humanity, not just a very, very small uh, subsection of it. When you look at the, the really rich guys who are doing this, it's very easy to criticize them and say that it's a billionaire's boys club. But the reality of it is they're doing a service to humanity that that's been done before. There's precedent for it. Uh, if we go way back, you know, most of us in the United States studied American history, uh, as biased as it is, it still has some relevance. Uh, Isabel and Ferdinand, they used their wealth and, and their um, narcissism to, to send <laughs> explorers, <laughs> explorers around the world. And that benefited us because trade opened up and that, that changed humanity irre uh, irreversibly. In the 20th century, we had Howard Hughes and the Hughes Aerospace Corporation, which advanced air travel, which now we can... Today's not the great example because we don't have $99 airfares right now, but at some point, hopefully we get back to having cheap airfares. That would have never happened without the billionaire Howard Hughes going out and spending ridiculous amounts of money on his pet projects. So when you look at the guys like Musk, Branson, uh, Bezos, Isaacman, it appears to people they're doing it for own, their own selfish purposes. Each one of them actually has a very... Um, noble reason for doing what they're doing. And you know, I'm not going to try to explain it for you, but, but they do have them. And we've just got to, we've got to work with those reasons as opposed to the reasons that a lot of people are telling you that, that uh, they're going and doing it for. So. I think that's the title of my next book, Wealth and Narcissism, the epic story of uh, <laughs> human ambition. <laughs> so for those who think about space exploration, one through the lens of what we've and others have termed the billionaires boys club some somewhat dismissively actually completely dismissively uh there's always been this pushback of we have so many terrestrial problems that require money attention and effort that we fail to address adequately so <laughs> what's with the billions and tens of billions and hundreds of billions that go into significant space moon mars landings telescopes you name it and during the Cold War, during the 60s, this period that is looked at retrospectively as this kind of glorious moment of literally reaching for the stars, a lot of the justification of that for both the Soviet Union and the United States was competition of, hey, if I can plant my flag on the moon, if I can send my crafts into orbit, I'm a better country than you, I've got a better system than you, right? It wasn't just noble exploration, it wasn't 
the latter day version of the the South Pole. Let's just go find and see what we can find and see. So how do you respond to that when people really do legitimately say, why are we wasting money or utilizing resources that are finite mm -hmm. on whatever is out there when we're failing to do it for whatever is here? Yeah, you know, I, I am, I have faith. I'm, a, I am a believer. I'm not a, I'm not a practicing practitioner of faith. However, I'm gonna, you know, pilfer, uh, you know, and, and I'll probably botch it. But the old saying of, you know, give a man a fish, feed a man today, teach a man to fish, you know, feed him for a lifetime. It's the same principle in that regard. Whenever someone says, well, you know, Bezos just spent umpteen billion dollars, you know, on his vanity flight. That would have been, that would have, that would have fed, you know, all of that would have erased poverty in the United States. Well, you could put that money against the problem right now, but you haven't addressed the underlying issues that caused that problem in the first place. So it's, it's almost a pyrrhic victory in that regard. Sure. You're, you're going to put some food in somebody's belly for a very short amount of time, but guess what? A week or two from now, they're going to be right back where they were. Um, the money that's being spent on exploration, space exploration in particular, has a tremendous knock-on effect. And I'll, I'll use one example. Um, I won't use the name of the company just because that's free advertising, although I'd, I'd gladly do it, but I don't want to, I don't want to overextend, but there's a company that does, there, there's several companies out there that do it, but I, we're involved with one company in particular that does uh, cultivation of meat or meat, you know, 3d manufacturing of meat. All right. And so there's lots of money expended in the exploration, experimentation, research and development associated with how you do, how do you print meat and the knock on effects that, you know, it was done, with the intent of, of solving for food issues on long duration space flights. But the method and the techniques that they use and the materials that they use are, are really quite efficient by comparison to how we produce meat at present. So they take enzymes and, and water and, and some other stuff that real scientists know how to describe, and they can actually manufacture a T-bone steak. You know, at some point, they'll get to a point where they can scale that and produce almost infinite amounts based on the number of enzymes they have and, and a certain amount of water. But the, the other side of this is through that exploration and the expenditure of capital to get there, we're gonna save billions of dollars. And on top of that, you now reduce the amount of land that you have to use to, to have cattle. You don't have to feed them the food and you don't have to use all the water. And as my sister-in-law will point out, the methane that cows produce uh, you know, is one of the major causes of climate change. So if you can eliminate all of those things, that has a grander effect on society than if they had taken their billions of dollars and just, you know, uh, bought all the food kitchens and given them supplies for a week or two weeks or three weeks, because that's just a temporary fix. Science is allowing us the ability to fix problems in, in perpetuity, as opposed to, you know, simply just making people feel better in the moment. Um, so that, you know, if someone comes and, and, and wants to argue with me about the money could be better spent elsewhere, I would ask, ask them to tell me how long is that going to solve the problem? And, and does that actually address the underlying conditions that cause the problem in the first place? Space is not the answer for all of it. The exploration related to space isn't the answer for all of it, but it gets us a pretty, it gets us a pretty good way to, to solving a lot of problems that are plaguing us right now. I think part of the problem here. Uh, I had this problem not too long ago is that I didn't really understand the connection between the developments that are going on in space and, you know, life here on earth. You know, the Ukraine war is a great example when you started to see satellite internet being given to Ukraine, which meant that they could keep operations up through this invasion. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm wondering where the, you know, where the communication gap is happening. Because like you were saying before, the space conversation kind of seems to have dropped out of the na national conversation before the last few years of, you know, the billionaire boys club. So how do you see that? Yeah, you know, so um, this will be a, I'm going to, I'm going to do a little bit of a plug, you know, the four main things that we took away from this event that we did. Uh, it was a retreat. It was a salon style retreat where we had people come together to talk about things off the record with the intent of finding areas that we needed to focus on to improve, um, you know, to increase opportunities to create more, more to increase our ability to create equitable opportunity for more people. And those four areas that we discovered were the areas of governance, uh, education, access, and narrative needed to be worked through. And those were not things that we put in place, um, you know, 
intentionally. We didn't we didn't focus conversations on them. They nat they occurred naturally through the course of our discussions and narrative. You know, to your point, Emma, how to tell a story is really really important. You know, Zachary is a professional storyteller. You are a professional storyteller. That's not a common trait for people. And so in order to, to invoke the emotions that are required for people to feel the need to do something, we've got to tell the story so much better. And um, maybe this would come out in some other way. So my, I mentioned my father was an astronaut. He was also the administrator at NASA. And you know I don't want to put words in his mouth, but, but we've had conversations that NASA is not the best PR firm out there. And so people don't understand all of the really good things that have happened as a result of exploration experimentation, research and development that National Aeronautics and Space Administration has done over the years. NASA has underwritten a tremendous amount of exploration and research that has benefited all of humanity, not just the United States, but we haven't told that story well enough. I mean, I can look around the room I'm in or in my house or in my car, and I would say probably more than 50% of everything around us right now was done as a result of, of the space program and the things that we had to figure out in order to, to sustain human life outside of the Earth's atmosphere. But until you can figure out how to tell that story better, it's never going to pick up steam and, and, and get real traction. Um, you know, two of my um, associates, uh, Peter Singer and August Cole, are, are masterful storytellers. You know, one of the reasons why we're affiliated is because I know and I recognize that they have a skill set that, that we can learn from. And that we can start to build on in order to tell that story better. It's all, you know, everything we do as human beings is about relationships and how we can communicate and relate to one another. And space is no different. We've got to be able to relate that, not just in, in our language, both from an idiomatic perspective and but from a nuanced perspective. How do you how do you translate space to speak to people in whatever language it is that they they like to talk? Um, I'm a bit of a Pulp Fiction fan. The movie, yes, but also the rest of it. Um, there's a scene in the movie Contact where, uh, you know, Dr. Arroway was was in front of this huge congressional hearing, and I forget what Matt McConaughey's character's name was, but he's this evangelical pastor, and he basically asked her if she believes in God, and uh, her answer obviously is no because she's an atheist, and his his response when challenged uh, is, you know, you're going to go and make contact with another, you know, species being or whatever, and if you don't believe what the majority of the people on this planet believe, then how are you going to represent us? And what that spoke to me and said is that there is a certain level of communication and narrative that we have to have that communicates to people in the language in which they understand. Uh, and, and that's really important. I think that's probably one of the things that has not translated well for space and space exploration is we haven't made it relevant to everybody. I love your phraseology of it's all about relationships. And that's certainly been a leitmotif of a lot of conversations we've had uh, with Arthur Brooks and with uh, John Wood. I mean, people who are, you know, in various ways engaged in that. And, and in many ways, I think there's a lot about the Progress Network that that is fundamentally embedded in that idea, right? That it's a sensibility you start with as much as anything else. And if you don't start from the right sensibility, everything that then follows is going to be either compromised or broken. Um, I want to step back for a minute. And if you could you talk a little bit about your own background, right? Your your father was NASA administrator, you were career military, he was career military. For those of us who haven't been in the military, right, there is a whole ecosystem of families, you know, fathers to sons, mothers to daughters, families that are in that world, right? They're in that career. And I'm just wondering, like, how you feel that shaped you, what your what your own kind of decision trees were within that. There's a certain inevitability of, you know, going into the family business and yeah. how that has felt to you, because uh, I think that's illuminating. You, you have a unique background, an unusual family, unusual by any stretch of the imagination, unusual as African-Americans, unusual as high achievers, you know, you name it, go down the list. I think probably your own kids are following in a similar unusual pathway. When I was growing up, you know, I came from a middle class family. Uh, my, my, my entire family were educators before my parents. My parents were the first ones to kind of step out of the out of the norm, or out of the, the, the vast lane of what we were doing as far as the family was concerned. Both my mother's parents and my father's parents are educators. And so they laid 
a very strong foundation, both from an educational perspective and a service perspective. Um, my father uh, decided to go the route of, of joining the military at a time where not many black folk did that, or if they did, it was because they were drafted, but he went to the Naval Academy, uh, got commissioned as an officer of the United States Marine Corps, and that, that set my family on a path of, uh, of, of, of adventure and opportunity. And through his skills, you know, he got selected to become a test pilot. Then he got selected to become an astronaut. We then moved to Houston, Texas, and I was surrounded by all these larger than life individuals, both the, the, at the time it was predominantly men. There were a few women in the astronaut program. Um, and so I grew up getting to see some of the best examples of selfless genius, uh, extraordinary accomplishment but a, a, an incredible sense of humility. And every time I, I had to think about what it looked like to be something worth emulating, it was all around me. And so a lot of my own decisions that I made in my life almost were involuntary. Um, it was the natural thing to do. Uh, I, I had flirted around with going to a bunch of different schools, um, but in the end, I ended up going to the United States Naval Academy, which uh, kind of, well, not kind of, it did follow my father's footsteps because he had gone there before. Uh, he was the first uh, black midshipman to be elected the president of his class. So, you know, my father has established a very long history of accomplishment and achievement. Um, and it's funny because a lot of times people are like, oh, well, you know, that's a lot to live up to. The, the thing that I can easily say without any hesitation is I didn't have to live up to anything. My mom and dad were very, very good about encouraging my sister and I to live our own lives, to be our own people. And so I never felt any pressure whatsoever to live up to some, some, some expectation, some false expectation that, that I may never have been able to achieve on my own. So, but I did choose to go to the United States Naval Academy and uh, I finished in the top 98% of my class. Uh, so that was fun. And then, uh, and then I got commissioned into the United States Marine Corps and became a Marine Corps aviator. It's and, always and that, that 2% though, Shay. I mean, that's true. <laughs> Well, you know, that 2% comes into a whole different discussion because uh, if you're at that 2%, then life is really, really uncomfortable for you. That's um, such an so arrogant I, comment, da arrogant like dad comment, Zachary, like you could do better. Why aren't you in the 99%? <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, you know, so- um, You're bringing I, I, shame I have, on your family, man. <laughs> I know, I have, to, uh, I, have to, I have to give credit where credit is due. I pilfered that from John McCain. He was in the top 95% of his class. And so I had to do one up from- from the late great John McCain, um, you know. So the, the, the choices that I had in front of me seemed fairly obvious, and and I'm you know I'm not somebody who backs down from challenges, and so if something was challenging, I decided to go and do it. And it wasn't for the sake. I mean, I'd like to think it wasn't for ego, but nonetheless, it was you know somebody has to do certain things, and I was having fun, and um, and I got to do some really cool stuff along along the way. Um, as I got older. Uh, I started to realize that I was given these opportunities for a reason. So what am I going to start to do with it? Um, my, my wife will tell you, I, I'm a contrarian to a fault. Um, I'm always pushing back on things. Uh, and that's what I've done, you know, since I can remember, uh, but more since my professional life developed, I just started finding areas that, that were challenging and needed attention and, and put my attentions against those. Um, different than what my father did. He, he, no less, you know, tackled challenges, but he did it in a, in a far more uh, cooperative way with people. Um, my, my way tends to either win a lot of really good support or gain a lot of really, really significant uh, pushback. Um, you know, but it's, it's, you might have to re-ask your question again, Zachary, because I tend to go on these tangents. So um, I don't think I was hitting everything you wanted me to hit. No, it, it, this was more about, hearing you describe your own pathway, because you do have, look, we all have a particular story, as you've talked about, and the importance of telling those stories. Mm -hmm. uh, but your story is more variegated, and I think more unusual than many. And then particularly, uh, this particular chapter that you're now writing, um, which I'm sure you would say, and you've certainly told me, you know, if your father hadn't been a NASA administrator and that hadn't been part of the DNA of your upbringing, that probably wouldn't have been where your energies would have gone. But then again, you have, you, you, you were, you were not going to stay static. You were not going to stay still. You were not going to just come to the, 
the terminus of your of your military career and play golf. Not that right. there's anything wrong with that. I've been playing golf. I'm crappy, yeah. but I, I still do it. I'm equally as crappy. Yeah, no, that, that it, um, it's interesting, you know, because every now and then, you, you know, you have to kind of take stock of your life. Um, I had a really surreal experience years ago, years ago. And there used to be this really um, cheesy show on TV called Pensacola Wings of Gold. <laughs> and in that show... They actually, I think it was Pensacola Wing School. They had a, a, a character, a black, a black character, a black man, who was an F-18 pilot and a recon marine and something else. I forget what else it was. And, and the really funny thing about it is that was me. You know, I was I was an F-18 Wizzo backseater, but I'd also done a tour with Marine Corps Force Reconnaissance. And, you know, so I was jumping out of airplanes for in my primary profession. That's a bad thing. If you're in a parachute, if you're under a parachute in the day to day that I had to do, that was really, really bad. But here I was at a job <laughs> where I was actually voluntarily living under a parachute for, you know, minutes at a time here. So that was a bit of a surreal moment for me because I'm like, all right, they just wrote a character that kind of mirrors the life I've chosen to live. And, but I don't think it's something I didn't think it was something, you know, worth putting on the big screen. But but some writer in Hollywood decided that they thought that was a good idea. You know, now fast forward um you know the the life i've been privileged enough to lead um you know one of the things about me growing up at the way i grew up is i don't get starstruck because a i was surrounded by astronauts all the time and by by virtue of living in houston in the 80s it was a place where celebrities used to come because the space shuttle program was just so amazing you know so i got to see a lot of really famous people and so nowadays if i meet someone who's famous i i, I some people with the egos that some of the very famous people have probably don't like it when I'm around because I don't really I don't really pay that much attention to them you know it's like oh okay they're a normal person you know but the life I get to live today partly because of the, my personality but also because of the, the opportunities I was given earlier I get to see these really amazing things and sometimes I have to step back and remind myself wow you know you, you really do have it really good um, but then at the same time I think about especially as a, as a black man in the United States of America, that that's not normal, you know, for us. Uh, and, and it really, a lot of the social news that's happened over the last five years in particular has really been a rude awakening for me that I have to do more. Um, you know, my entire life, a lot of times I get seen of as an exception uh, rather than someone who's done exceptional things or had exceptional opportunities. And that, that really kind of eats at me all the time. And I've, I've started to talk about it more in public uh, because it needs to be said, you know, just because Che Bolden went to the United States Naval Academy, played football, ran track, you know, became an officer in the military, flew F-18s, you know, got to get to a really cool rank and get to do some really amazing things with amazing people. That doesn't mean that I'm a one off in that regard. It just means I was given the opportunity and I took advantage of that opportunity. There are so many more who look like me who are far better than me. That just didn't get the opportunity and so i now have to take the the positions i've been given and the privilege i have to try and shine a light on the fact that we're missing out on so many talented individuals that can make a difference in this world that look like me or they look like you emma or or i've got three daughters you know my three daughters can change the world um if given the opportunity and that's really kind of where we sit uh, you know we're at a, we're at a time in human history I won't say it's unprecedented because I'm sure it's happened time and again um, because human beings tend to make the same mistakes a lot. But when you look on the news today, and unfortunately, the time we're recording this is in the aftermath of the latest, uh, you know, mass shooting terrorist act. Um, human beings, you know, we've got to start to open our minds a little bit more and recognize that there's excellence and opportunity in some of the most uh, innocuous places that we don't think of. You know, when you look at somebody and think they're beneath you, first things first, check yourself. But secondly, find out what it is that motivates them and how you can pull them up to do something amazing. Because, you know, I'm trying to be a, as optimistic about the human race as I can. And, and the most, the easiest place for me to do that is to just take a look at each individual and see what capability they have. And, and back to your question earlier, Zachary, that, that's, that's probably just as much of a reason why Interastra exists now. It's because I think that we have barely scratched the surface on our capabilities to explore space. And there is some kid, you know, sitting in Nairobi, Kenya, or in, um, uh, you know, Quito, 
that we've never given the opportunity because they're not American and we don't think that things of, of, of significance come from emerging world or emerging countries. I wanna change that. I think we can change that. So Shay, I'm wondering if you could connect the dots a little bit between um, the equitable opportunities piece that you just brought up now um, and what it was like for you in the military because mm -hmm. the military is a really interesting place where the rank and file is super diverse, reflects the American public, very you know unusual, I guess, in that way. Um, but then when you go up the ladder, it's like Wonder Bread land and it's all male. Um, Man, you, know, and, you guys yeah. have done your research. You really know how to push the buttons. Um, oh, <laughs> we had someone write <laughs> no. an op-ed for us actually, who was in the military, um, black men in the military, writing about how optimistic he felt about new conversations in the military about race. So that's when I started to get a little bit more. Yeah, about. no, the, the conversations are emerging and they're great. Um, the opportunities haven't really changed that much. And, and here's the problem. And I'll give you a, a, an incredible thing just happened like literally just happened in the past week, week and a half. The President of the United States nominated a Marine Corps general, black Marine Corps general for his fourth star. That'll be the first time that the United States Marine Corps, my, my service, you know, part of my heart, um, will have someone who looks like me wear four stars. That's great. My fear is that there are people out there who will think that that's enough. And that's, and that we, you know, hey, what do you have to complain about? Look, you've got one. And that's the way it's always been. You know, uh, my father and I, we're separated by 25 years in our professional careers. Yet when he was one of one, 25 years later, I often was one of one myself. And so equitable opportunity in a place where I grew up and, and it, 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 you know, dictates a very large portion of my personality. I can tell you as an institution I love, it is flawed and it's got a lot of work to do. Um, you know, we, my company, we did a study last year to kind of look at an, an aspect of that as to why. So, so for a quick history lesson, uh, the United States Marine Corps opened. So uh, the services were in, integrated in the 40s. Uh, the, the United States Marine Corps opened aviation to blacks in 1952 when Frank Peterson became the first black marine aviator. He was the first black officer in the Marine Corps to get promoted to the rank of general in 1979. You know, so that part of that was natural because you can't become a general until you've done all the other stuff. But from 1979 until today, the Marine Corps has only promoted two more black aviators to the rank of general. My father was the second in 1996. Brian Kavanaugh was the third in 2016. So each of them are separated by almost two decades. That's a problem. You know, when you when you have an entire portion of the military that doesn't seem to be equitable, and you'll get people that are say, "Hey, we're a performance based organization," and they've been, it's obvious that people just didn't perform. That is BS. You know, <laughs> Perfect. That there there is no there is no exclusivity between performance and the diversity as represented by the fact that you have general officers that don't all look the same. You know. And, you know, the, the, the black aviator dilemma, if you will, is just an avatar for anybody who's not a white male. You know, if you look at the leadership across the military, it is disproportionately white and male. Um, we look at the enlisted ranks, kind of Emma, to your point, you know, the, the, the rank and file, the people who do the real work of the military is, is, is a good representation of America. And I can only speak to the Marine Corps because that's the only one I really know. But even the senior leadership within the rank and file is a good representation of America. And in some respects, it's disproportionate because the enlisted ranks have figured out that leadership has no you know, set form. And we have a large number of our senior enlisted leaders in the Marine Corps are people of color, are women, um, so much so that it, it mismatches uh, in some regards. And that's not a problem. I mean, especially if you consider for all this time, at least in America, all of our leadership has been white and male, which is a, which was a mismatch. So it's not a problem. You know, young Marines, they follow leadership. That That is the same way across all of the military. So when we talk about what's equitable from an opportunity perspective. There are things that need to be changed from a policy perspective, from a cultural perspective, so that anybody has the ability to rise to the rank of a senior leader in the military. And right now, the, the, the culture is not set up for it. And in some respects, the system is not set up for it. 
Uh, but that's a whole different different conversation. So there's a lot of work to be done. The example of Mike Langley now being a four star, and then the, the other gentleman I referred to, Brian Cavanaugh, is about to get his third star. You know, that's progress, but it's not lasting until there's a pipeline behind them that they can do it. And there's really the, the pipeline is really really scarce. Uh, when we did that study, uh, the the community I came from, so fast jets, there were 500 and 580 pilots. Uh, that flew jets in the Marine Corps, three of them were black. Wow. So. Well, I guess first the question is, what does one do about that institutionally, right? Mm -hmm. we're, we're clearly in a moment in time and have been in this moment in time for seemingly a long time where yeah. the conversation about the necessity of these changes and the acceptance of that necessity seems relatively widespread in the way people talk about you know where we are where we need to go mm -hmm. but that connective tissue seems lacking even with a climate uh, where where the conversation appears to be directionally what you would want it to be yeah um here in the united states we we have this sense of exceptionalism that has led us to believe that if you're good enough, then you're going to you're going to achieve what you deserve. But that that ignores the fact that a lot of the criteria that we set up is geared towards a, a, a very small demographic. Uh, and then, and but because we try to tell ourselves from an altruistic perspective that it's all based on merit, we don't recognize that even the things that we say. Are, are meritable, that's a word, um, have, are, are, are fallen a certain line. So I, again, I can only speak to what I know. The way that the Marine Corps evaluates its officers and its senior enlisted for that matter, and the, the criteria that we put out there is, is an experience-based criteria. It's not actually, there's no real hard metrics. So the officer fitness report in the United States Marine Corps asks every ranking officer, the person who's ranking the people below them, to provide a, a, a qualitative evaluation of what they do. And so it's based on their perspective. And, and we are all uh, subject to the bias that we have from our experiences. And the term I've, I've used a lot um, is duck, ducks pick ducks, right? You know, <laughs> this person looks like me. And so I'm comfortable with that. And, and that look is not an actual physical look. It could be a performance look or experience based look, but one way or another, we associate people who are with, with people who are like us. And that tends to lead us, lend, that lends itself to us exhibiting bias towards that individual. And that's the way that the officer system in the military works. You know, the senior officers, because they're senior and they've achieved things, they put merit into the way that they did it. And they'll look to other people who did it the same way that they did it. Now, when you talk about the equitable opportunity, back to Emma's question earlier, you know, a young black man or woman that comes into the military is likely not going to have the same experiences as a young white man or woman that comes in. And, and that has a direct impact on some of the things that we ask people to do when they first come into it. And I suspect it's just like this in the corporate world. I'm learning that now. Um, but I am I am a neophyte in the corporate world. But when when someone new comes in, there are certain intrinsic things that they have that are get, allow them to succeed right off the bat. And if they're familiar with some of the things that are happening in that environment, then that makes it that much easier. So in the case of the Marine Corps, again, the only reference I have is if you're a good swimmer and you're a good outdoors, then you're gonna you're already ahead of the game. Well, the way that the United States is set up, you know, through our history is there's not a whole lot of black folk that swim a lot because in the inner city or in other places, pools are not a normal thing. And it's not because, and these are the things that I heard growing up. It's not because my, my muscle density is so much more that I sink to the bottom of the pool, or it's not because, uh, you know, my body fat content is this, that, or the other. It is literally a matter of exposure. And the example I can use for that is my father. Uh, when he grew up in the segregated South in Columbia, South Carolina, uh, his parents were very, very adamant about him learning how to swim. And there was a, there was a pool around the corner. And so my dad learned to swim from a very early age and he was on the swim team all the way through his swim team 
won the South Carolina State Championship. Now, mind you, it was integrated, it was a segregated championship, but nonetheless, they were all very good swimmers. You know, and so as I grew up, I was I was put in the same situation. I was on the dive team, but I learned how to swim from an early age. And I was in the water all the time. And so when I got to the Naval Academy, swimming was not an issue for me. When I got to the to the basic school, which is where every Marine officer goes, swimming was not an issue. When I got to flight school, swimming was not an issue. But at every single one of those places where I was asked to be evaluated on swimming, I was automatically put before anybody even asked or knew into the remedial section. When I was at flight school, you know, all of the black students were pretty much automatically put into the remedial swim session. And I went along because I was going to see how this, you know, as an experiment, how it's going to play out. We went, I don't know, I forget the, the course of the instruction, but it was maybe three weeks long worth of swimming. And uh, when we finally had to do the swim test, I was the second one out of the pool. Uh, the first person to beam had been a collegiate swimmer. And, and probably not to my surprise, all of the instructors there were patting themselves on the back that they had taught me so well how to swim in a matter of three weeks. But the reality of it is they had nothing to do with it. You know, same thing applied for my father. You know, he as going through as a test pilot and as an astronaut, there were always these times where people just assumed that he wasn't a good swimmer, but that wasn't the case. But but those are the things, you know, when you have skills like that, that sets you up to succeed in an environment or an organization like the Marine Corps. If you don't have those skills, you're automatically behind and the system is not set up right now to, to balance that out and, and give people an equal starting, you know, starting position in whatever organization. I, I, I would imagine the same thing applies for computer programming or, or trading you know, on the stock exchange. If you don't have certain things at the very beginning, then you're never gonna be as good as the person who comes in with more information. Or like golfing, like you guys were talking about before, yeah. right? Like that's a huge <laughs> problem with women coming into the corporate world. Like, yeah, I don't know anyone who was raised to know how to golf. Nobody, nobody. Right, yeah, no, exactly. There, you know, it's it, it's human nature. We we tend to gravitate towards people who are more like us. That's unavoidable. Um, but the people who are doing things the best right now are the ones that recognize their bias and, and adjust for it and, and make you know make whether it's concessions or or allotments or whatever. They know that they need to pay more attention, you know, to these characteristics that that maybe somebody doesn't have, uh, but they can learn. So. So Shay, I was wondering, you know, just to switch gears a little bit to go back to, you know, you mentioned these four things that came out of the retreat or the meeting that Inner Astra had, um, equitable opportunities and to talk about the narrative and you mentioned governance. Um, mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about the governance piece, because I don't have a good concept of like, I, I actually, I'm kind of just imagining space like the wild west, you know, you have like a couple of countries or a handful of countries and then some private companies, I mean, are there norms, are there rules, are there regulations? What's going on over there? Are, there? There, there, are, there are some norms and there are some rules, uh, but they're written by a very small group of individuals. Um, the golfers. You know, <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, the golfers and the vodka drinkers. So that's a bad stereotype. That's a bad stereotype of Russians. Um, but, you know, for the longest time, the United States and Russia wrote the rules of the road. You know, the Chinese are, are envious of that. They want to be able to have a say in how, how the space is, is conducted. But even more importantly, I think this was before Christmas, but the head of ESA, you know, kind of made, it wasn't an offhand comment. It was very intentional. But he said something to the extent of, you know, Elon, Ru Elon Musk is, is writing policy for space exploration right now. Mm -hmm. One individual, because he has the means to do so, is dictating how we use space. You know, Starlink, uh, while it's bringing a lot of capability to humanity, is 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 rapidly taking up a lot of space, which sounds really counterintuitive uh, because space is infinite. But guess what? <laughs> There's this layer around the Earth that we've got to get through to get to the rest of space, and it is rapidly being populated uh, by a bunch of stuff. You could call it space junk in some regards, uh, and others, it's it's just stuff. Um, so, you know, one of the very first areas that, that governance is really kind of rearing its head is how do you regulate who puts what where and for how long? Um, I've heard this. I haven't seen, visible, you know, video or, or photographic proof, but I'm told that there is a visible ring around the Earth now. You know, it doesn't have a naturally occurring ring like other planets in our solar system, but now it does have an artificial ring. And if you think about launching and getting things into orbit, whether it's low earth orbit, geosynchronous orbit, going into a cislunar or even beyond, the risk of hitting something is, is getting higher and higher every day. 
And so there will have to be some rules as to who puts what into space at what time, where they put it and how long it stays there. One of the areas that we talked about with governance was how do you make it more accessible? Um, you know, in the United States, there's a couple of organizations that oversee whether or not someone can launch something into low Earth orbit or, or beyond. Um, and if you don't comply with their rules, then you can't do it. And unfortunately, a lot of those rules are onerous enough that it takes a lot of capital to, to navigate those rules. And so a startup launch company may not have the means and the knowledge to actually position themselves to be able to put something in the orbit. And so when we talk about governance, there's a lot more discussion that needs to happen and a lot more voices that need to be at the table in order to, to expose you know, certain challenges or, or, or issues. Um, and so that, when you talk about the governance piece, there just needs to be a better Congress, if you will, um, that helps to set the path. And it can't just be the United States, ESA, the, the Japanese, the Russians, and the Chinese. There's an entire continent of 55 countries that has a, a say. There's another continent below us here in North America that has a say. And then there's Southeast Asia. The Indians have a, have a tremendous interest in space and, and they're very capable in what they're doing. You know, they've done things uh, on a much faster timeline than the United States did, but they haven't had a voice at the table. And so from a governance perspective, we just need to get a more representative set of voices uh, that can kind of help guide what we're gonna do. You know, you'll often hear people say space is for all humanity. But right now, our policies don't necessarily support that. And, and the progress that we're making in space exploration uh, doesn't support that. And so we got to change that. I have to say, I've been struck as I've become more attuned to what's going on in this realm, partly by just knowing you. I've been struck by the self-selectivity of people who are, are drawn uh, to be in space as a as a life profession, whether it's scientists, engineers, pilots, uh, administrators, funders, entrepreneurs, that there's a very high quotient of dreamy optimism, of sort of forward-looking possibility. And like any set of human societies, I mean, you articulated it well about the limitations of uh, ducks pick ducks and people gravitate towards the like and diversity is a challenge at every level, you know, intellectual, gender, race, cultural, tribal. But it does seem to me that there, there remains something about the exploration of space that attracts people who are drawn to the better angels of their nature and are kind of driven by a a core optimism about the potential of humanity to solve problems and explore the unknown and move through whatever fears we have to something better. I mean, has that been your experience of it or am I romanticizing? You're, you're accurate. No, I think it's accurate. And I think it's luck, frankly, I really do. Um, you, you know, when I, if I say institutional space, um, that could be considered synonymous with national security. You know, and so most of the people who've been involved in space and space exploration and the expenditure of capital to get there, the, 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 the number one reason they've done it is for national security. A very close second was the, the pure uh, curiosity of science and scientists. They, wanna, they just wanna know more about it. Um, I went, I went and participated in a, in a space conference in Africa. And there was, we were very fortunate to have intimate interactions with several heads of agency there. And the unfortunate thing as it stands right now is most of those space agencies are part of their ministries of defense. And you know, during the panel I spoke on, I, I kind of implored them. I said, as soon as you possibly can, if it's at all possible, you need to separate your space effort from your defense effort mainly for two reasons. The, the number one reason is it makes it hard for, you know, private industry and commercial entities to do business with you because a lot of times they don't want to be affiliated with a capability that might, you know, help human beings do some really bad things. The second reason is that by disaggregating any space endeavor from the context of national security from a military perspective is that you open up the opportunity now to use space to look in, into the new space area, those areas we talked about earlier, agriculture, education, health. Th there are so many things that we can learn through space and space exploration that will help humanity 
but that can only be done if it's if it's disassociated with you know conflict or things like that um space up to this point the the, the voices that have prevailed have been those that have been science-based i think largely because space is just so hard you know it's complicated and and the science behind it requires really really thoughtful and intelligent people to do it and those people if you want to think that the human brain is limited i think that their their intellectual capacity to do really really smart things outweighs any um fear that would drive them to think of it in a, in a kind of a defensive mentality but as we get more people involved just be prepared that there will be more voices that want to do not good things with space and so the one of the the um, prophylactics that we can use against that is to bring more people in that are looking at it for, for purposes that are good. Um, and, and those people tend to be very optimistic. You know, if, if you're a pessimist and think that things aren't going to work, science really isn't your thing. Um, so I, I think it's been a combination of luck and natural selection. You, you just can't, up until this point at least, you couldn't be involved in space unless your primary thought process was one oriented on one of discovery and, and exploration kind of stuff. But we may have run, we may have run out of that now that it's becoming more accessible. We're going to start to see a lot more different perspectives come in that it may not be as as dreamy or as uh, visionary as what we've known in the past, Zachary. So I, I hope that we keep the positive aspects of it uh, at the forefront. But there is this distinct possibility as the more people will start to pay attention to it and get involved that bad actors will, will be there and they'll have some influence. Speaking of uh, getting more people involved, I feel like I have to ask this question on behalf of like ordinary people everywhere who are just waiting to see if they can go on a space tour before they die. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Could this be possible before I die? Let's say seven, 50 years from now, are we, are we anywhere near there? Can we sign up for a space tour by, you know, yeah, 20 years? Yes. It's, it's not so much whether you can or can't, it's whether you can afford it. And right now, right. the answer is no, none of us can okay. afford it. Uh, and I'm, I'm right there with you. I, I, uh, I cannot afford it. I don't anticipate being able to afford it anytime soon. However, this is, again, one of those positive impacts of the, of the Billionaire Boys Club and their, and their vanity flights. Um, the more flights they do, the, the quicker the costs will come down. The more exploration that they, the, the more of their own internal research and development dollars they put against because they're business people first and foremost, and it doesn't it doesn't bode well for them to have this super expensive um, liability on their books. The faster they figure out how to bring the cost down, the sooner we'll be able to do it. And I do believe that we're on a positive trajectory for that to be the case. I, I actually don't believe the, the predictions that some of the people who are in the industry say, because it's very, very optimistic, mm. um, but you know, if our lifespan goes another 50 years, Emma, uh, I'd say it's 50-50 that we'll be able to afford going to space. Now, I'm not an insider from that perspective. I don't, I don't know what Blue Origins books looks like. I don't know what, uh, what SpaceX books looks like. I, just, I don't know what Axiom books look like. So all of the different companies that are out there, I'm not aware of, of their R&D plan or, or their strategic plans as far as how they're going to bring the cost down. I do know that's objective of theirs. Um, you know, the ride sharing is, is probably the easiest way to do it. And so when you look at how SpaceX in particular has been able to help other companies deploy microsats, nanosats, satellites, and the like for a much lower cost, that's a pretty good indicator of what we can eventually get to with human spaceflight. The challenge with human spaceflight is that, um, you know, you got these pink squishy things that if you destroy it, you can't really remake another one. And so there's safety measures that they have to consider um, and so that that will inherently make the cost a little bit more exponential and harder to bring down. But where the cost of launch for someone who wants to put a thing into space has already come way, way down and it's affordable. If you want to launch a satellite that enhances, you know, the progress networks uh, reach, it's affordable. Um, but if you want to send you up to do a podcast from space, we're not quite there yet. Well, Emma, I think that's uh, going to be next on our, our, our next meeting agenda. Satellite. Going to space. <laughs> progress, <laughs> progress network satellites into Satellite. space. That uh, <laughs> will be our next thing. Che, it's always a pleasure talking with you, but more to the point, what you're embarked on is, is just a fascinating journey, which I'm going to enjoy 
watching, maybe participating in, but definitely supporting because I, I get the point fully about as this becomes as space as a as a frontier becomes less of a frontier and more of a product of both national security energies and investment and economics, the whole warp and woof of humanity is going to be on display, not just the golly gee willikers or the Cold War space race mentality. But you're going to keep this spirit going in the more we have a possibility here to solve some problems, make some things right, uh, move the needle. And I'm very pleased that you're part of that discussion and part of that movement. Well, Emma, Zachary, I appreciate the opportunity. And I'll put my last plug in there. You know, the International Platform is we intend for it to be the global public square for space and the space economy. And if, soon as, the sooner we can get it up and running, the faster we can create more opportunity. And so if there's any funders that listen to this, please reach out. I'm, I'm, I'm in an active seed round right now. So, uh, and being a career military guy, I have no clue how to raise funds. So uh, <laughs> take pity on me and, and don't, don't beat me up too much. But thanks again for the opportunity to speak with you all. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Um, and Zachary, I knew you were a good conversationist already anyway. So Emma, it's, you make it even better. So <laughs> it's been great. Thanks, Thank Shay. you, Shay. So, Emma, I thought when we were going to have this discussion that there'd be a lot more delving into the Jeff Bezos and the Elon Musks and the Branson. And we certainly talked about, as a reference point, the Billionaires Boys Club. Uh, but in many ways, I think what's helpful is the recognition that while that group has drawn more attention to what's going on in terms of the race for space that isn't just about NASA and isn't just about the history of these things. Um, it's a far, far more complicated, variegated universe <laughs> than <laughs> simply paying attention to what a few billionaires are doing would suggest. Uh, yeah, the space puns are out of control. Uh, I know, this it's, episode. Tough. It's, um, tough. it's true. I mean, there's a lot going on out there to the the narrative piece of what we were talking about. I really think people don't know about, um, you know, I was reading about manufacturing things in space that you can't manufacture on earth, including pharmaceuticals, lunar habitats, um, I, I, you know, even Google maps, you know, you need space for Google maps. Like that's definitely improved our lives. So what the next iteration of that could be is exciting to think about. And I was struck when I went to this gathering that the Che alluded to a few times, which had a few hundred people of, you know, just how much is going on in that particular world that unless you're in it, you don't really know about, but it just does involve tens of billions or probably hundreds of billions of dollars when you add it up. I mean, this is not an insignificant corner of human endeavor. It's just not one that we pay a lot of attention to absent those very high publicized moments where, you know, Musk builds a bigger rocket or says we're going to go land on Mars and just how many people are thinking through these issues, thinking through what what laws should govern the commons of space, how should the moon be governed? I mean, even though we are decades away from having meaningful presence on the moon, let alone Mars, there's already a lot of people sitting there scribbling down what the rules of engagement should be and what the how you should carve things up or how you should work together or how you should compete. And obviously, until that's a real thing, it, it's going to remain kind of a theoretical side note, but it is, it is quite fascinating how many people are actually engaged in all this. Yeah. And it's kind of, it, <laughs> there's a lot of people engaged and a lot of people unengaged. Right. And the, the funny thing is, you know, we talk a lot about how people really pay attention to the fear and the risk and, and all of this. Uh, and you'd think that you would have more attention on space because of the like tail risks of mucking around up there. I would yeah. imagine that some pretty bad stuff could happen if we go wrong. Well, I'm sure the next time a satellite falls and if it falls in a habited area, it will, it will <laughs> tragically draw the attention and human beings often need the tragic to draw the attention. Let's hope that there will be some more attention given before that happens, but I guess we'll have to see which we will. Mm. So I'm going to thank you again for the conversation. Thank you all for listening to What Could Go Right from the Progress Network. And check out our newsletter. It's free. And we will keep having these conversations. Thank you, Zachary.